For my 40th birthday, some friends very kindly gave me a watch. It was a really lovely gesture, and that moment and the warmth and love that accompanied the gift has stayed with me ever since. The watch came with a birthday card making reference to the fact that time is the most precious thing we have and thanking me for being in their lives. It was a lovely and heartfelt gesture. But in all honesty, at the time, I quietly thought to myself that the gift was a bit odd because I already owned a watch. My Rolex GMT Master II, which I'd bought for myself following some of my very first paychecks and which I wore literally all the time. My friends knew that, but it clearly didn't make any difference to their decision to gift me this watch. At the time, I just didn't see the need for me having and owning another watch. A few years earlier, I'd bought myself a Cartier Roadster whilst on holiday with my wife. That was very different from my 40th birthday experience, and it happened for a couple of reasons. Basically, my Rolex had gone away for a service, and it was going to take months to come back. At around that time, I I missed having a watch on my wrist, and I just happened to walk past a shop window, and there it was. The Roadster caught my eye mainly because Mrs. Watch Enthusiast London already had a slightly smaller version of the exact same watch, and so in that sense I thought it would be a fun watch for me to own, and that my wife and I could be watch twins. It was kind of cute, and at the time we both liked that. But after my Rolex GMT Master II returned from service, it had gone straight back onto my wrist and stayed there ever since. My birthday gift was simply a very generous present from friends. It wasn't a matter of need, nor indeed a wish or a want. At that time, my knowledge of mechanical watches was very short-sighted. Decades before, I'd owned to aspire a Rolex for, I dare say, many of the same reasons that young men today still covet them. It was as much about status and a symbol of achievement for me, and it was also my, my one-and-done wrist companion. I wore it always, regardless of whether I was playing sport, swimming in the sea, dressed up, fancy, or, or in a work suit. Very occasionally, in the 18 years leading up to my 40th birthday, I'd noticed how watches and watch adverts on posters and in magazines had become increasingly prevalent. There were just so many adverts of different types of watches. Beyond that observation, I never paid any notice or attention. And every now and then, I would wonder to myself, what all the fuss was about and why anyone would need to own more than one watch. In that sense, the proof was in the pudding, in that my Cartier Roadster has pretty much stayed locked away. It rarely sees daylight and I seldom, if ever, wear it. So there I was, unexpectedly receiving a gift, a new watch which I didn't need or want and about which I knew nothing. I'd never seen a Bremont before that moment and I knew nothing about the brand. I'd simply not heard of Bremont. At the time, this was early 2011, I don't think that many people had. So as the red flush and warm glow in my face began to subside, my curiosity kicked in. It turned out that my friend had bought himself a Bremont some time earlier. He'd bought one of their very first watches. They were numbered at the time, engraved on the rear. It was an Alt 1C. Partly out of excitement, And also because it seemed like the right thing to do, I took off my Rolex and put on my new Bremont MB2 for the first time. As I did so, my friends started to tell me a little bit about Bremont. The fact that it was a British company. The association with Martin Baker, who make ejection seats for aircraft. As it turned out, he had met and then got to know the two brothers who founded the Bremont watch brand. My curiosity grew from there. I'll introduce you to them if you like, he offered. This watch was very different from my Rolex. My GMT Master II has its history rooted in aviation, and it seemed that Bremont did too, but in a different way. At home, I started to compare the two. There was much more of a tool watch feel to the MB2. For starters, it was a bigger watch. I soon learned it had a 43mm case diameter, and the Bremont was slightly quirky, there being a striped mini ejection handle on the seconds hand. The watch was robust, tested beyond endurance was the company strap line, 
and it was presented on a leather strap as opposed to a bracelet. Initially, I wasn't really sure which watch to wear from one day to the next. Do I put my Rolex back on or continue to wear my new Bremont? I wasn't entirely sure whether I would have bought this watch for myself. It was so different from what I was used to wearing. Decisions, decisions. Frankly, I wasn't really sure whether I wanted, let alone was ready to wear another watch instead of my Rolex, but I decided to give it a go anyway. I chose to wear the MB2 primarily on this NATO style strap in those days, which was also in the leather wallet that had come with the watch, rather than on the black leather strap, which was initially a little stiff and needed to be worn in. I felt that the NATO style strap option worked better and it was more military in style. Plus, it was more all purpose and it meant that I didn't need to remove it from my wrist getting in and out of the shower, the bath, the pool. Over the next few days and weeks, a few things happened which made me want to continue wearing my new MB2 and not take it off my wrist. It started with people noticing my watch and also with me suddenly being more conscious of the watches that other people were wearing. I began to notice what was on other people's wrists and more than that, it became a curiosity and a bit of a habit for me to look. That's when I realized lots of other aspiring young men, and, and men my age, were wearing Rolex watches. In fact, to such a degree that at social gatherings and in the workplace, Rolex watches were frankly unremarkable, and dare I say, downright boring. It was all a bit predictable. Conversely, others would look at my Bremont and comment upon it. Perhaps they too had grown bored with the preponderance of Rolex. That was new for me. I hadn't appreciated watches in this way before. It was a whole new appreciation of what was on my wrist and how that made me feel. To my mind, Bremont was a terribly British brand that was for the more discerning consumer. And I liked that. This watch was a grower. It most certainly wasn't a Rolex. And yet I still felt the quality. It's a premium product and as I say, slightly quirky, brilliantly well-made, technically clever and patented on various fronts, and actually rather beautiful, but in a functional tool watch way. Bremont, and somehow my MB2, had a personality, and that was something I hadn't ever considered before, certainly not as far as the Rolex or Cartier brands were concerned. This all comes back round to the brand, and to the values and the people behind the brand. It contrasted with other more characterless watch choices, which for me don't have the same connotation or meaning. So, as I say, I've very much grown to like Bremont and the various Bremont watches out there. I like their style. This happened over a period of time. It was early in my watch journey and I think significantly also relatively early in Bremont's too. As my exposure to the Bremont brand became more frequent and more regular, my connection with the brand and its watches grew and became more intense. In a sense, I was growing with and alongside them. I think this probably occurred in tandem with my relationships and friendships with both Nick and Giles English, not to mention their team. I'd see the brothers regularly at air shows, watch launch events and also informally too. I found myself very much rooting for the Bremont founders, willing them on to succeed in their mission and admiring how they were trying to put British watchmaking back on the map. A natural consequence of this was that I found myself finding reasons to buy their watches, something which began with me buying the limited edition P51. At the time of the P51 launch, I still had a similar mentality in that I didn't see the need for me to own any more watches. I now own three mechanical watches. However, I basically wore my MB2 non-stop for the best part of the next decade. During that 10-year stretch, I found reasons to accumulate more Bremont watches. Initially, the P51 was a watch that I bought for my two sons, who were very young at the time. The P51 was a limited edition of 251 watches, and each watch was engraved with its number on the rear. The numbers I'd chose had my sons and their interests in mind. 
at the time, they were mad crazy about Cars, and in particular the Disney Pixar film Cars. Consequently, I bought watches numbered in conjunction with the characters in the animation, number 95 being Lightning McQueen, number 43 being Strip Weathers, the King. If you have young children and have seen the film, you might begin to understand this obsession. I thought it was a cute and fun way of buying a watch for my young children who would one day inherit these timepieces and understand the era in which they were acquired. Initially, I thought about just putting the two Bremont P51s in a safe and not wearing them. Nick English had later suggested that they could change any part of these watches if they were to get damaged and that locking them away would be a shame. It would be the wrong thing to do. Enjoy wearing these watches, he encouraged me. So I did. Instead of keeping these watches pristine and locked away, I started to wear the P51 that I'd designated for my second son and made my wife's father the custodian of the other. He's a long-time watch geek and was both happy to receive and honoured to have been asked. That was really just the beginning of my Bremont journey. I wasn't interested, nor was I looking at other watch brands at the time. I was simply enjoying the novelties that Bremont were producing, and following my purchases of the two P51s, I fell into collecting other Bremont limited editions. Again, finding reasons for doing so each time a new release was presented. It wasn't until shortly before COVID hit the UK that I started to take an interest in other watch brands. That's a different story, which I might return to in a future video. My overarching point here is that something really compelling happens when you get close to a brand, when you learn more about what goes on behind the scenes and when you sample the product at an event. And Bremont really know how to throw launch events. I liken it to being a little bit like the classic visit to a vineyard or to doing a brewery tour. Once you learn about how everything works behind the label, the manufacturing process and how and where ingredients are sourced and how it's all put together to produce the final product, which you sample at the end of the tour. In the moment, to me at least, it always tastes like the best thing on earth. I've bought products from vineyards and breweries to enjoy them in the comfort of my home over dinner or whatever. And whilst it never quite tastes the same as it did in the moment at the brewery or at the vineyard, it nevertheless tends to elicit the same positive good memories and feelings from being at those tours. For me, it's a little bit like that with Bremont. I'm pretty sure that I wouldn't have ever got into watches were it not for being gifted one. If someone had suggested to me at the time, or introduced me to Vacheron Constantin, or perhaps Patek Philippe, or indeed other watch brands, I'm not sure I would have been bothered to look. It's different when somebody gifts you an item like a watch, because the choice is made for you. It wasn't a case of me deciding what I might choose to wear, or why I might be drawn to a particular watch. Not a bit of it. I was merely given a watch, which I then wore instead of my Rolex, which had never left my wrist. I used to think, why should I take off my stainless steel Rolex and wear another watch with a strap? Because then I'd need to remove the watch when getting in and out of the shower or bath or down at the beach before taking a dip. To me, after so long, the thought of doing that was a little odd. However, someone bought me this timepiece and interestingly, it was British and it had a story and my friend knew the owners and founders to whom he later introduced me. All of this made Bremont more interesting and my personal experience more of a journey for me to continue exploring. So in this video, I thought I would talk about the three rarest limited edition Bremonts that I own. Here's a Longitude, which is my favorite Bremont watch for many reasons. This white gold version is one of a limited edition of 75 watches produced. As I say, it's my favorite partly because of what it stands for. It was the first watch to carry the ENG movement, which heralds an enormous sea change, not only for Bremont, but also for British watchmaking. It's a very wearable 40 millimeter case size on my wrist, white gold, but not obviously white gold and at a glance can pass as a stainless steel watch. It's utterly beautiful and it's also got British heritage embedded within. The watch incorporates original brass from the historic Flamsteed Meridian line 
at the Royal Observatory in Greenwich. The Flamsteed Meridian Line marks the historic position where the first astronomer royal, John Flamsteed, made his observations and laid the foundations for accurate timekeeping and navigation. I wear it a lot, and easily more than the other watches I'm talking about in this video. The little-known Bremont 10th anniversary watch, marking 10 years from 2007 to 2017, this is one of a limited edition of 50 watches. Actually, this isn't one watch. It's actually a pair. The 43mm version is probably the most complicated watch made by Bremont to date, an annual calendar complication with moon phase. Again, it's white gold, but it's also a very modern and practical wear, having loom on the dial, which I like, not least because I keep a watch on overnight. The date indication is a little tricky for me to read these days, but the rest of the calendar functions are more readily legible to my eyes, and the blued hands are so beautiful. This is the 37mm variation in the Bremont Solo. It's not a watch I've particularly worn at all. I used to feel it was a bit small, and yet the 37mm case is a really good size for me, which is something I discovered after buying my Saxonia Thin. You'll see they're identical case sizes. However, the thickness, when side by side, makes the Bremont look monster. The fact is, this is an 11 mm watch thickness, which is pretty decent, but remove the Saxonia Thin from the field of vision and it looks perfectly fine and is still very wearable. The 37 mm case and the thinner strap dimensions make this a more classy wear, and because of the bezel design and the dial size, it just looks more petite. But fundamentally, it's a classy and elegant watch to wear. It has an oddity though, the only bit of loom on the dial is in the arrow at 12 o'clock. Not quite sure it has any significance. This is the Bremont Victory in rose gold. It's one of a limited edition of just 40 made and is probably the most collectible timepiece I own. So much has been said about this watch. It was an early purchase in my watch journey and the historic nature of this timepiece, which is really a bit of an antiquity, encased in a modern vintage style, makes it more of a ceremonial watch to wear than anything else. I tend to wear the Victory on special occasions, and I'm still pleased that I opted for the rose gold version as opposed to the smaller and more wearable stainless steel. This was the first watch that I'd come across with a 30-second retrograde second hand. There's also a retrograde date function. This complication in itself is a source of fascination. The watch also includes a 12-hour chronometer too. The dial is beautiful and features intricate details on both front and the back of the watch. For example, the engraving on the sapphire crystal at the rear. It's one of those things that you know only if you're aware. It's almost indistinguishable. Some people are able to carry off wearing a watch of this size I'm really not, but that doesn't make me love it any less. My wife is not a fan of this timepiece. This is not a watch that she can appreciate or seems able to appreciate. Instead, she refers to it as my gypsy watch. Whilst referring to Mrs. Watch Enthusiast London, she's previously asked me whether I own too many Bremont watches. It's a fair question. And there are those who seemingly don't understand my interest in Bremont, nor how I got here. In part, that's one of the reasons why I made this video. What's next for Bremont? Well, they now have the financial backing to take the brand forward in a much more significant way and to break into the mainstream. Like many, I'm sure, I am very interested to see how the new CEO, Davide Serrato, takes the company forward. Whatever happens next, we're going to find out soon enough.